Um, Anne's going to lead off. We're going to do a recap of uh, Data 16. So the Tableau Conference, talk about some of the roadmap. Uh, devs on stage, some of the new features that are coming through. Uh, we'll take a break at some point. And when we come back, um, I'll go ahead and I'll pick it up. We'll talk a lot about uh, community, what transpired at the conference, and then some events that we have going on next month. And then our 2017 strategy, where we really want to get you engaged, uh, understand why you're here for the user groups, what you're looking to get out of it, uh, and how we can build uh, a better community uh, for all of us. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Anne, and we're going to get started. Okay. All right. Awesome. So first I want to start off and just, I, I know most of you, but can you guys just raise your hand if you actually went to the conference? Okay, that's wow. a, a ton of you. That's awesome. So this is going to, yeah, this is really great, guys. Um, so cool to see that. For you guys, it might be a bit of a refresher. Um, I'll tell you that as I was preparing to give this talk, I went through and watched the keynote again, and I watched devs on stage again to kind of distill it all down to talk about it. For those of you that didn't go, um, this is going to be a chance for you to kind of understand at a high level the strategy for Tableau for the next two to three years and some of the um, features that are going to be coming sooner than that, maybe six to eight months or the next few releases. So I'll go ahead and intro myself. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is me, Ann Jackson. I'm co-leader of your Phoenix uh, Tableau user group, which I, I'm thrilled to be a part of, honored to be a part of. I am a Tableau Desktop 9 certified professional and also desktop qualified associate. By day, I am a senior informatics analyst at Aetna. By night, I'm going to call myself now a data blogger, or I'm very active in the social community, specifically with Tableau. So when you see my business card or my personal card, that's so you can interact with me socially, where I talk about and promote Tableau, mostly on Twitter, also on my blog. Um, here's my specifics. So my personal blog, you can follow me on Twitter, which is probably my social hub, how you can interact with me. And you can also find out a lot about the Phoenix Tableau user group by following me there. And if you aren't into that sort of world, you can always um, connect with me in a professional capacity on LinkedIn. Okay, so for those of you who didn't go, what did you miss? Well, you missed out on over 13,000 attendees, um, 9,000 of which, including myself, were first time, so that's about 70%. Tons and tons of sessions, I mean, over 500 plus uh, hands-on sessions, breakout sessions. Uh, there are four main um, general sessions that uh, everyone kind of went to. So two of them are the guest speakers, Bill Nye, who was pretty freaking awesome at the end, talking about the climate change and, and sparking your enthusiasm and passion to help change the world. And also Shankar Vin Vindatam, who talked kind of about the hidden, hidden brain. And then um, there were two sessions, and this is what I'm going to be talking about today, which is first, Tableau's vision. Again, that sort of two to three year roadmap. And then uh, devs on stage. All right, so the keynote session, um, and again, my intention here is just to get you in the know about what the future holds. So Adam Selevsky, the, the newly appointed president and CEO, started the session off talking about how they were working on promoting a culture of analytics across enterprises large and small, with the goal being, and I'm reading here, to make better, more informed data decisions, which I think we're all really happy to hear. One of the things that uh, I really left feeling um, enthused about was he kind of expressed that innovation is the lifeblood of Tableau and they expect that their um, agility, their effort in terms of innovation is going to continue at that same pace or accelerate. So that was really cool to hear. Uh, after that, Adam sort of welcomed Christian to the stage and you know Christian's one of the co-founders of Tableau and he kind of talked about um, where Tableau has been and where it's going. It was really nice to hear him draw analogies between data visualization and how it's kind of like reading a, a terrain map, talking about how much context and content and the richness of you know uh, a trail map is and how when you think about data visualization, it's the same thing. There's a lot of very deep questions that you can ask and get answered by something as um, visual as a map or data visualization. He also paused and took a moment to kind of orient everyone with where they've been. So this is kind of like Tableau from inception, I guess I would say, up through 2015. So it's interesting for me, as someone going to the conference for the first time, to see what they had kind of talked about previously as their main keynote highlights. So they started out, obviously, in 2003 
with their visual query language, the VizQL, and then drag and drop mapping, so we all know that geospatial analysis is huge for Tableau, and then the data engine in 2010, the data server in 2013, and the data interpreter uh, last year. He also kind of teased about a couple data visualization components as he was talking and kind of wanted to highlight what those were. The first one I think we've all heard about before is the viz in a viz. So this is almost like a visualization in a tooltip. This was kind of touted as something that was going to be out there. He demonstrated it, no real concrete details, but as he described it, as you hover over data points, related visualizations will appear and provide even more insight. He also talked about layering, and this was again going back to that sort of parallel of um, geospatial geography, that type of analysis, that we should be able to um, visualize data sets that simply share a common dimension. So one of the demonstrations that you'll see is a map where you know you have three different data sets. One is of schools, one is of residential areas, one is of something else. And instead of having to join them or blend them together, you can seamlessly layer them on top of each other and really enrich um, the analysis that you have. And then again, the last one he kind of he just vaguely mentioned this. He said improvements in multidimensional animation and teasing out changes in the data. Not a lot on this, but I thought that was interesting to highlight as something he said, so I'll be intrigued to see what there is to come. After kind of talking about uh, data visualization, he stopped and took a moment to talk about databases and how the data query engine had been separate from data visualization. And that's a big part of their strategy and has been a big part of their goal going into this or as they continue to emerge is um, bridging and partnering those two things together because we all know that we need to query our data really fast to be able to ask those iterative questions and be able to visualize and get to what we're looking for. So sort of with that, the stage was set for the five key topics that were covered in the keynote. And this is kind of what I'm going to kind of go through. So from visual analytics, the data engine, data management, cloud, and collaboration. All right, first up, visual analytics. So Andrew Beers came on stage to talk about visual analytics, and he really started by saying three things that he wants to help us improve or achieve. The first is to ask better questions, to think more deeply, and to solve bigger problems. And that kind of uh, keyed it up for three additional things and three ways we'd achieve that. The first being instant analytics. The next one, improvements to time and space analysis. And finally, natural language, which is pretty cool. So Andrew started by showcasing a few features related to instant analytics, and I apologize. I mean, you're not going to get the full um, experience by my presentation, so I encourage you go um, watch the keynote if you have time. Just listen to it at your cube if you need something to do, and stop and look at the demos. Right now I only have screenshots, and they're not that great, but once you go and you see it and you interact with it, you're going to have those aha moments and see how you can start integrating it into your world. So anyway, the first one he showed uh, related to instant analytics is this hover line. So this is pretty special here because he's got this uh, vertical hover line, and by doing that, you can see, and there's multiple lines here, you can instantly see what all of those different marks are at. So instead of having to you know, start at that, I think it's a purple line, and then go down, and then do that, you now have that instant analytics, that summary comparison, to start understanding your data in context. And the other thing is, is selection summaries. Again, kind of hard to see here, but if you can imagine, there's sort of like a dragged pane here. And across the x-axis is time. So he's segmented off a period of time. It's got a starting point and it's got an ending point off the end. So now we've taken something, I think it was maybe some sort of sales, and now we have change over those two time periods. If you were to look at it even more in the demo, there's a max and a min highlighted as well. So that means you don't have to build out that next visualization or the people that are interacting with your visualization, they don't have to do that. They already get that next question. I want to know immediately which one had the most positive change. Now I can see it. It's San Francisco. It's not doing a table calculation. It's not starting here and making the next viz. It's already done for you. And this idea of selection summaries, it's not unique to time. It can also be used on just you know data points, data marks. So not exactly sure, let's see what we're showing here. Country carbon dioxide emissions compared to GDP. So again, we've got different marks, and you can see that this selection box here, as soon as it's selected, you're getting these summary metrics on different dimensions within your data set to start understanding more deeply what's going on, to start finding commonalities in your data. It's pretty cool stuff. And that also works for cluster summaries. I like this as well. I've talked about clustering in the past. So clustering is an algorithm to determine you know, like groups of data points. 
So this allows you to say, okay, you've got your clusters now, but how are they linked together? What's the relationship? And how do I sort of describe it in you know, human terms of what's going on? So this gives you that really quick picture. So if we looked at cluster one, we could see where it is in terms of internet usage, and then cluster three, and get a better understanding of how Tableau has done that clustering. Again, so when you take it back to your business user, your client, you can explain and describe the data for them. So instant analytics, what does it mean to you? Five main things, the hover line. So instantly view values of marks that are segmented into categories across a common dimension. Typically time or what was demonstrated was time. You can set boundaries in time to instantly get rolled up metrics on performance, which I really love. I mean, if you think about operational metrics, it's always over time. Time is super substantial. So when you have something like this, it's a game changer. Uh, you can select data points and automatically generate summarized visual visualizations. So you're going to gather context more quickly for your data sets. Uh, quickly highlight categorical data found in tooltips to see peers. I didn't mention this, but that's another thing. If you were to hover over a data point and you have your tooltip and it might have different categories. So maybe the country is United States. You can click on United States now and it's going to highlight all of those peers that are also United States in your data sets. So you can start seeing quickly the scattering of your data. <coughs> And then also, find and describe the commonalities identified through Tableau's clustering capabilities. All right, I hope everyone's having fun, because I sure am, and there's a lot left. So next up, um, he demonstrated some time and spatial analysis. The main thing here that I want to point out is this is the analytics pane. So this is where you have the reference line, you have clustering, you have totals, you have forecasting. Now you have this awesome section here called time. And there's two different things he demonstrated. The first was to align time. So that means if you have things that start at a different point in time, instead of a table calculation to get them all to start at a point one, it's now built in, it's drag and drop. And then likewise, you can index time. So this right now is showing median price of homes in the six US markets. We're using the hover line here, and if you look across the y-axis, this is the percent difference. You're using the hover line to determine the percent difference from a point in time. So it's literally charting for you automatically is it above or below this anchor point? And you can move that anchor point. It's pretty awesome stuff. So time and space analysis, what does it mean for you? And I kind of touched on the, the geospatial already. So imagine layering different geospatial data sets, uh, which will be really powerful. So most common ways to visualize time will be integrated into the analytics pane. No need to index time using table calculations to find a common starting point. And the integrated hover line can uh, change the starting point for analysis related to change over time. Again, these are really huge improvements and they're going to make it easier for you to do your work. Okay, the last uh, area that Andrew spoke about was natural language support. So using a text input feature to start asking Tableau questions about the data. I guess technically like putting us out of a job, but <laughs> I think it's not like that, but it's pretty awesome. On the next slide I'm going to show you like an animation. What you should take away from this is, and what Andrew really highlighted is that they're really piggybacking on and making sure that they're aware of the ambiguous nature of the questions of how people ask questions of data. So here it is, you can see it's saying, this is real estate in Seattle, I think. So show me the most expensive houses near South Lake Union. So most expensive near, and it's already figured out what that is. Some of the cool things on here at the top, like. It's creating filters because near could mean something different to you and something different to me. It makes them for you so that you can adjust that. Same thing with most expensive. Right now it's deciding what it is, but it's giving you flexibility. This is pretty huge stuff. So what does it mean for you? You're going to be able to interact with your data similar to a search engine. It's going to consider fuzzy logic and build out flexible tools for you to interact with. And I would say kind of important if we talk about the industry and where it's going, this is a direct answer to Cortana integration that's in Microsoft's Power BI. So interesting to know that as Microsoft Power BI is really coming on the scene, Tableau is aware of that and they're already working towards developing a competitive product with it. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> data engine. Okay. So VJ Doshi came on next uh, to talk about the data engine. I'm going to just read my notes here because they're they're awesome. So the team is building out the data engine, a new kind of data engine for the modern data analytics area, era. It's called Hyper. And Hyper, according to VJ, will take us to new levels of analytic performance starting in 2017. 
So what we can imagine from this is there's going to be faster data analysis, faster data ingestion, and enterprise scalability. There was a hands-on demonstration where he took billions of records and he started manipulating them live on stage. And again, I'm, I'm quoting VJ here. Hyper was joining, aggregating, and sorting as fast as the user. Done at the speed of thought. Ask a question, get an answer. Load the data into Hyper, it just works. So what does the Hyper Data Engine mean for you? It means they really are doubling down on this idea of super fast data querying. It's not enough to have access to your data. You need to be able to manipulate it instantaneously. So you'll be able to take your data from, according to VJ, millions to billions, and extract building is gonna go from hours to minutes, and you're gonna get consistent high performance for tens of thousands of people on a shared server. All right. Next up was Dan Jewett, who talked about data management. So he jumped on stage to talk about the future of data management, and a lot of that involved creating certified content. So in Dan's own words, a trusted data source where the proper joins, security rules, and optimization have been put in place, really allowing your IT folks or maybe your um, data subject matter experts to create these certified data sources so that when you get to that self-service analytics model, other people can manipulate them and can feel comfortable and confident with the data that they're using. So kind of interesting to think about, this is server, big push towards Tableau server. If you're not using Tableau server, I think this is trying to push you towards Tableau server. So there's also an ability to perform impact analysis on data models and update them from the server. So you can quickly add in new calculations to be part of the data model as users start using them more. So kind of in Dan's example, he had um, he was showing, you know, which are the most frequent fields, which calculations are used, how many workbooks are calculations used. Okay, should those just be part of that published data source, that certified data model? And will that make it easier for the end users who are doing self-service analytics to do um, their work? What's also interesting is that um, there are indicators that are going to be present throughout the data sources to show which calculations are derivatives and which ones are certified. So if you're coming in as someone else looking at the data source or looking at the workbook, you're going to be able to instantly say, okay, you know, this is something that Anne made up. I don't trust her, so maybe we won't use that. You, you all trust me, but you know what I'm saying. So here's a screenshot. This is the server. So, you know, we have our data sources on here. You can see already right now that it has the different certifications on there. It's got the usage. It's got a whole lot of information. So again, imagine where the Tableau server really is your repository for um, data sources to um, liberate your self-service analytics environment. Okay, so the real showstopper when it came to Dan had nothing to do with data governance. I, I know Michael clapped a significant amount about data governance because he's the server guru of the two of us, but the real showstopper of the keynote had to do with data preparation and specifically Project Maestro. So I'm just going to read what Tableau says Project Maestro is, and then we can all kind of take it, breathe it in. So Project Maestro will make it possible for more people, from IT to business users, to easily prep their data with a direct and visual, that's the key here, approach. You'll see the impact of the joins, unions, and calculations you've made, ensuring that you have exactly what you need before jumping into analysis. Project Maestro will integrate with the rest of the Tableau platform, letting you quickly publish your data to Tableau Online or Tableau Server, or analyze it on Tableau Desktop. All right, so let's get you oriented with Project Maestro. The demo was way more in-depth than this, way cooler than what I'm gonna show you on a single slide. So again, I encourage you, if you're scrolling through it, stop when you get to Project Maestro or go to the blog and read more about Project Maestro. There's three main areas going on here. There's the top, which they're calling the canvas, and it has sort of the workflow of data. There's the middle, which they call um, the profile. So it's almost like a metadata summary of what you have in there, and you can even see the join in there. And then the bottom is just you know record level data. It's what your actual data is. So cool things that happen. Um, as Dan was demonstrating, and he took some of these years here, they were two digit and he made them four digit. Once he did that, a calculation was automatically made. It was kind of tacky, it's a little icon right now, but it described what the calculation was. All you had to do was interact with the data to change it. It made the calculation for you. That's pretty cool. Uh, the next thing is the joins, kind of understanding what's going on and being able to show you where you might have problem areas with your joins. You can already see it's very visual in red. These years are not going to be part of the join data set because they're not included on the left. Or you can see also that there's District of Columbia and Washington, D.C., and although they're the same place, they don't line up. One of the other really awesome things was drag and drop lookup. So 
Dan demonstrated taking, I think it was like number for states and just dragging it over something else, using that as a lookup. So you don't have to set up any lookups, you just drag it over and it's gonna join that data together. So according to Dan, Maestro will be available later next year and I think that this is really awesome to see that they're extending their product suite beyond um, data visualization tools. So data management in general, what does it mean for you? Two main things here, first would be the certified data sources. Uh, data models can evolve and everyone can operate with a single source of truth, which I think we'll all kind of silently cheer for. And then Maestro, data preparation becomes a visual process, seamlessly allows you to go from prep to analysis in Tableau. Okay, uh, Ashley K also came up on stage to talk about the cloud. Uh, she walks through sort of the landscape of where data is housed, it's housed in different places, some online, some cloud hosted, some on-prem, and how data is really everywhere. And a big part of their goal is to be able to analyze that data no matter where it is. And I'll also say that that same concept applies to being able to analyze data using Tableau. So no matter where you are, you should be able to interact with your data in some sort of Tableau platform to analyze it. The key takeaways for cloud, so uh, live query agent, this is gives you the ability to securely tunnel through firewalls and directly access your data. They're also um, really working on integration with cloud applications. So Tableau is gonna start leveraging, and it already does this uh, known schema to make it easier for you to analyze your data. And that even takes the form of pre-built pre visualizations. So think about something like Salesforce or Marketo or something housed on the cloud. You can just point to that data source. It'll say, here's a couple different visualizations. Like for Salesforce, here's, here's a leads dashboard that you can start piggyback on, packing off of, you know, here's a, you know, my case is one, and you can imagine how easy it's going to get, get to that point of um, analyzing it. Fully connected. So Ashley kind of described that the suite of products will work across all devices, the goal being you save it once, you can access it anywhere, and this is really critical. The strategy and their end game is that all desktop features are going to function in the browser. And also, um, she mentioned that uh, Tableau Server is now going to be available in Linux, and that's currently in alpha, and it's supposed to be available next year. All right, the last area is collaboration. So Francois Agensat came on to talk about collaboration. He had a few demonstrations. I don't really have any here. Just know that most of them originated in the server, and I'll just kind of walk through what those are. The first one is leverage the work from others. So what he demonstrated was he started from a workbook from scratch from a data source and he dragged in a couple fields. Tableau Server automatically recommended workbooks and visualizations that pre-exist that he could bring into his analysis if he wanted to. He could enrich his workbook with that or he could just simply leverage something that a data expert already has out there. Uh, communication, now you'll be able to message um, your peers inside of Tableau Server. If you have a question, you can get an answer. What's really cool is, as he demonstrated it, he was at a specific spot on a visualization, clicked on a chart, you know, clicked on a bar, and he sent almost like a screenshot of where he was in that visualization to the subject matter expert for that data, and he got a response back, and that response back also said, hey, not only is this interesting, but take a look at this. So it's pretty powerful stuff. The next two, um, alerting and metrics, these are huge. So alerting. Within server, you're gonna be able to set up alerts when different data points go out of control. So get an email, get a text if something is exceeding a threshold. That's pretty cool. And then metrics, I call this the dashboard of everything. <laughs> so metrics, if you are someone that interacts with the server, you can go into any workbook, any dashboard, you can pick a mark, make it a metric. That means it's summarized, it's saved. Tableau server is gonna start tracking that for you. If you're an executive on a phone, on a plane somewhere, you can pull up your metrics and it's your um, custom KPI executive dashboard. And this is great because you can take multiple subject matters that maybe the data doesn't work well together and you can start combining them. So this really, as, as someone who's a Tableau developer, this eliminates the I need a dashboard of everything of 50 different data sources and gives them the capability to pick the ones that are most valuable to them and start tracking it how it works for them. The last one is uh, both a personal and a team sandbox. So again, more space out on the server so you can develop in your own space or collaborate with peers. I liked how Francois said it was sort of like a, a safe haven for you to be able to develop that's not so visible to everyone else. All right, we're getting to the end of the keynote. So again, the five major areas that were discussed, visual analytics, the data engine, data management, the cloud, and collaboration. When we talk about 
uh, time frame on this, think two to three years, 12 to 24 months, maybe some in early 2017, but this is to orient you on what you can expect the future to be with Tableau. So if you go back to your boss and they say, you know, how's Tableau gonna work for me in the future? These are some key takeaways, some things that you can say, okay, well, it does this now, but this is what the future is gonna look like with Tableau. Probably the more fun and engaging session is devs on stage. So the dev developers on stage shows off capabilities that are coming much sooner than that. So Andrew was back to kick it off, and what was cool is that uh, the developers that came on stage demonstrated over 25 ideas that were developed by the community and put into place. So for those of you not aware, uh, the Tableau online community, you can submit an idea, and often those ideas are developed out and put into the software. So it's really awesome to see that you have a company that takes your feedback seriously into consideration and then develops it and puts it out there for you as that end customer. First area they talked about was analytics. And I'm just going to kind of walk through these. These are very um, tactical features. These are very real features that are coming out soon. First relates to geospatial analysis. So there's going to be automatic drill. You're going to be able to zoom into lower levels of geographic data based on the view. In the demo, we had you know, maybe state on the view and then zip code. You start out zoomed out, you can see all of the United States, you're at the state level. If you wanna zoom in to Texas, Arizona, whatever, it's gonna start boiling itself down to the zip code level. That's really huge when you think about your interactors and what they wanna see in terms of their data. There's also going to be a map scale present, which I don't, that doesn't really resonate with me, but there, it got a lot of cheers, so I think it must be important that people understand how you know, large the world is. And then the spatial file connector. So you'll be able to add in your own spatial files. In the example here, they have uh, climate zones in Africa, and that specifically is going to be available in the 10.2 beta. More on analysis. So statistics and tooltip selection. So there's Python integration, it's coming. So you're gonna use Python code. So machine learning, advanced analytics, you're gonna be able to embed it directly into a Tableau calculation. So here it is, we've got Python written directly in a calculated field. And I touched on this earlier, but tooltip selection. You can select any categorical field from a tooltip, acts as a quick highlighter, and you can use it to quickly understand more about your data at a glance. Before we move on, go back to this. Is anyone doing advanced analytics, Python? Do they want to? <laughs> Layla, how are you not raising your hand? <laughs> I think you will be. One of the, the most realistic, I think, types of analysis that a lot of us can do is sentiment analysis. So as hot as clustering has been, sentiment analysis is probably the next thing. Python's a great one to do. Um, there's a Makeover Monday that came out this week by one of the Zen Masters, Britt Kava. It has sentiment analysis of song lyrics. She used Python integration in Tableau. So really cool stuff. So if you're interested in this, at the end, during my presentation, we'll, we'll talk to where you can go to get this, integrate it into your version of Tableau, and, and just start playing with it. All right. So more good stuff. Again, this is still sort of in the analysis section. Filter presets, new lines, and legend per measure. Filter pre presets, that just got a huge round of applause out of me. So you can now automatically filter your, date, your data to the latest date. So look at this. This is presets. You can set it latest date value or current date value. That means as your data refreshes, it's gonna start filtering um, to the latest date. This is huge, <laughs> this really is. Uh, new lines, uh, this is kind of an interesting concept. So step lines and jump lines. A step line is a vertical line between two points. So if you imagine you're going across time instead of the data points just being connected directly, if it's going like a, a direct vertical drop, you'll be able to see that now and kind of visually um, eyeball or measure what that changes between those two data points. And then jump lines. Jump lines break the data apart. So the example that was shown on Devs on Stage had, I think it was like the 100 meter dash for world records. So when you have something like a jump line, you can quickly see that length of time that something has been at a certain level and then it jumps down. So you can start, again, measuring the length visually of how long something has been um, in that particular time period. The last one, I love the, I'll, I'll start with the second thing. The rewards of highlight tables. So legend per measure, quantitative legend for each measure value. This picture does not do it justice. This is the best part here. We've all been in that world where we have 
what we want to do is something we did in Excel where we had, you know, different conditional formatting for every single column. That's possible again now in Tableau without doing anything crazy. You just click a button. Now you have a legend per measure. Okay. Uh, next up is dashboards and stories. So this is all sort of look and feel. Improved design capabilities. This got the biggest applause of the night, I kid you not. So distribute evenly. So now you can take your sheets within a layout container and automatically distribute them evenly across the container. You can kind of see it here. There's a couple summary sheets, but there's just a button here. You can click it, distribute evenly, boom, it looks beautiful. Uh, yeah, clap for that one. Uh, Margin and padding control. So again, more control over the visual design of it. I think what we're seeing is data visualization is sort of a creative outlet. It is a form of artistry, and we should be able to have a lot of those advanced controls that you would see someone in more of like a typical um, artist role. Borders, you're gonna be able to add borders to any object in your dashboard. And then one that Michael really likes is the expressive text editor. So taking text from basic, you know, from just being able to bold, italicize, pick fonts, and now you can embed images in there. You can make them hyperlinks. There's bulleted lists, horizontal rules, and columns. And this is everywhere that text is. So this is really cool. Web authoring updates. So six new things you can do on the web, and I would imagine these would be happening shortly. So map box backgrounds. Again, adding custom backgrounds to your maps while you design on the web. You'll be able to hide headers, add reference line, resize headers, uh, disaggregate data, and then format numbers. The story points are also coming to the web and they're gonna add new story point navigator styles, which I think is really cool. Now you don't have to have that caption there. There's actually cute little um, buttons to kind of scroll through your story points. And then you'll be able to have a full screen viz in your browser, which is kind of nice. All right, next area was mobile. So mobile updates, uh, direct linking. So what was demonstrated is there was an email that had a visualization in it. You could click on it, it would automatically open up the app and you could get directly into your viz. Uh, smooth tool tips, I think this is great. We all know that Device Designer came on the scene with Tableau 10 and I know that as I was doing uh, my Iron Viz entry for mobile designer that there's some headaches around the tooltips. You couldn't really leverage them in a way that worked well for mobile because of how smaller screens are and how hard it is to interact. So what they introduced is this sort of like, it's probably like a force touch where you push on it and now a crosshair will appear so you can completely control the precision around the different marks that you are interacting with. And they've also docked the tooltip to the bottom of your screen. So now you'll be able to get that summary tooltip data without it interfering with what you're seeing in the visualization. Commenting. So similar to the collaboration that Francois mentioned, they're also gonna have commenting in the apps as well. So again, start thinking about almost like a Slack style or just like a direct back and forth communication on anything that's going on within your mobile app related to your viz. And then offline interactivity. So really huge on this is you can now interact with your visualizations offline. So selections, tooltips, and highlighting will all work and be interactive without any sort of network connection. Anybody uh, that attended the conference go to the labs and play with mobile? So on this, nothing is obviously set in stone. This is all in development still, but as you were playing with it, um, she mentioned the tooltips automatically just show up at the bottom. Kind of like if you think about captions on the desktop, they're just there. Anybody have feedback on whether or not that was a good idea? One of the suggestions that we thought is your hands on a phone, it wasn't apparent to us until we were playing with it 10 minutes later that there's tool tips. And what we thought would be nice is that they flip or we have a configuration to actually show above it, um, if that makes sense. So you have your phone, you're hovering with your finger over the visualization. Normally where your palm would be, this is where your tooltips are. And you're like, oh, let me do some read some. What we thought would be more intuitive is to have the tooltips fly up to the top. So those types of things, if you didn't go to the labs, um, <coughs> as we come out with the beta and those alpha products, is to start engaging with Tableau off your feedback so we can get more improvements to the products. But it'd be nice to hear, uh, if you did play with it, what, what your thoughts were on it.
Yeah, and I think one of my goals kind of coming into this session, and I'll tell you, I'm on slide 51 and 57, so almost done, was for us to have some time to really talk about what we experienced at the conference. So those of you that didn't go, maybe to kind of give your feedback on what you've seen. For those of you that went, let's talk about what you know gets you excited, what you clap the most for. All right, I think there's two more areas. The first one is data. So data improvements, join calculations. I think this is pretty cool as well. So you can create a join calculation. So the demonstration, um, they were combining fields. So they combined a first name field and a last name field, and then used that generated, that calculated field to join to another data set. That's pretty cool. Uh, database union. So now you can drag and drop tables from a database and union them together. So if you have partitioned data over years, now it's just drag and drop, union all together. That's pretty freaking cool. Uh, also, again, all of this is really cool. Uh, the PDF connector. So grab tables from PDFs. It'll read your PDFs and pull the data out. Uh, the demonstration had a lot of data.gov data that's housed in PDFs. This is really cool. You're no longer scraping that data out manually or using something else. You can now use the PDF connector and it's going to scrape that data out. Again, you'll be able to interact with this tableau. You can visually decide what things are and how to prep it for um, analysis. And then the JSON connector. JSON, you know, raw data type file, that's another kind of hot topic that's coming on the scene. So it's nice to see that now they're integrating with um, JSON files and it's going to infer the schema from those JSON files so that you can interact with those sort of raw data forms. And then kind of rounding it out was extensibility. So this is really pushing the limits and in, in, in open source type things. So this is almost like development you know, on the edge of impossible. So server client library, you can now automate moves from deployment to production. I can't remember the developer's name, but he showed sort of a Python script where you could take your workbooks from the dev environment to the production environment. He mentioned how much code has been eliminated, so it's gonna be a much more automated process for you to be able to get it from one environment to the next. The same thing with their document API. He, he mentioned it was going to be simple to retarget your data sources to, from maybe dev or QA to production. The rest API improvements there, so high resolution images are supported and then JSON and core support so you can deeply embed Tableau in your websites. The get data function, it integrates with third party charting libraries like D3, that's another one that's really coming on the scene right now. Uh, you know, if you look on Twitter, you'll see a lot of D3 integration. You'll see a lot of people starting to do advanced data visualization in D3, so it's like Java. So it's nice to see that they're on board with that. They're on par with that trend. And he also showed a demonstration of a D3 visualization connected to Spotify Music, which is available uh, on their GitHub. And finally, mobile app bootstrap. So you're going to be able to embed your Vizies in your own mobile apps. And they're really trying to help um, get you guys there. So a lot of documentation out there. He mentioned that, you know, for the novice to the, you know, super awesome app developer, that whoever you are, you'll be able to utilize uh, the documentation that they have out there. All right, rounding it out. Next year, the conference is in Vegas. It's in October, so it's a month sooner. I hope you guys are all as excited as I am to go. It really is a life-changing experience and I, I say that as someone who only comes here because I want to they're not paying me to be here you're really gonna if you missed out if you've never gone uh, imagine the enthusiasm that I bring to the stage but then there's 15,000 other people with the same amount of enthusiasm it's gonna be in Las Vegas there's no excuse for us not to go I mean we're so close and um, you're gonna get a party bus and yes so uh, yeah exactly next year party bus sure. It's going to take us a week to get up there along the way. <laughs> and then kind of rounding it out, if you didn't go or you did go, remember to check out pclive.tableau.com where all of this stuff is available. I was in one of the hands-on sessions and they encouraged us to take all of the documentation, all of the learning materials off of their laptops. I ripped three gigs of knowledge. So you can imagine how much stuff is out there. Spend the next three months every day, going in, watching the breakout sessions, looking at customer stories, seeing how you can interact and play with your data, just getting an idea of what is possible and what's out there. And again, it'll keep your enthusiasm ramped up, keep your energy um, really high for Vegas in 2017. All right, so that's it. Uh, you don't have to clap, but let's talk about you know the conference, how everyone thought it went. What was your favorite? What sessions? 
Simmons, 50 tips. That was a good one. Yeah. What else? Iron Biz, anyone? really interesting. I think you see a lot about user experience and interacting with data, and so it's always really nice to see how they're picking up on that technology. How many people actually hit up the labs? I thought it was pretty nice. Yeah. So if you didn't and you do plan on getting on the bus next year and going with us, uh, I do recommend going to the labs. It gives you an opportunity to get hands-on with some of the future either re releases or start playing with some ideas. Uh, some of the things that they didn't show on stage uh, was actually in the labs for you to play with. Um, and those are things that are just ideas. You know, well, what if we were to do something like this? How would that look in your environment? You know, give me your feedback on uh, backwards compatibility. You know, how many people would love to have that in Tableau? And how would that look like? Should you be able to open up things in 8 and 10? Can you maybe save? Uh, a file in an older version and, and backwards and so forth. So those were a lot of things that were talked about in the labs and that was one of the reasons why I spent you know half a day in there with the eye tracking, with the mobile, with you know some of this cross uh, platform with the, the backwards compatibility. And it was different every day. So it was important if you did have the app kind of check on some of those labs and I do highly recommend next year um, to do that. For those that did go to the labs, what did you play with? What did you like? Anything? I went uh, to for the same uh, session that you went for, the mm -hmm. mobile version. Um, I do like your suggestion of them providing us an option to maybe switch where the tool tips are shown. But I think I was, yeah, I was just happy that they are not blocking my view. Mm -hmm. Even if it was at the bottom, I think that was still a win, but it was a good uh, experience. And who else went to the lab? Jessica. What did you like to see? So I went to the mobile one too. Um, that can be really, I got a, a bunch of users reach out to me this in the last few months asking, hey, what do we do with mobile? Um, I also went to a desktop lab and, um, and I got to play with Tableau 10 and I got to ask her some questions. You know, in general, we, I don't think we had the lab last year at the conference. Or if we did, I really didn't know about it. I didn't experience it. So for me, um, a lot of times, a lot of sessions, it's hard to get in the door 